Titan V may not be a gaming card, but it gives us some insights as to how the Volta architecture could react to different games and engines as opposed to Pascal. The point isn't to look at raw performance in 100 different titles, but to think about what the performance teaches us for the future potential gaming Volta cards. This will look at Volta architecture. Obviously, you shouldn't be spending $3,000 to use a scientific card on gaming, but that's what we're doing for now, and we'll add more tests in the next few videos. Our teardown should already be online, but for now we're focusing on overclocking and frame rate, and then we'll move on to production, power, and thermal videos. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly, makers of the Conductonaut liquid metal that we recently used to drop 20 degrees off of our temperatures. Thermal Grizzly also makes traditional thermal compounds for use on top of the IHS, like Cryonaut and Hydronaut pastes. Learn more at the link below. So this is it. The card is in pieces. We are currently in the process of probing all the different MOSFETs to figure stuff out for Buildzoid for his PCB analysis, and we're working on other tests as well. But for now, we're looking at frame rate. Now, this card, to catch everyone up to speed, you can find the specs table in the article linked below. We can put it on the screen as well. No point in going through all that when you can just read it. And it's a bit boosted over Titan XP in CUDA cores, but there is some deficit in the core clock, which tends to happen as you increase core count. The big thing here though with Volta, or with the Titan V specifically, is that it's not a gaming card. That means it's got a whole lot of stuff on the GPU that will never make it to gaming GPUs as they roll out. One of those examples would be tensor cores. Those are utilized for deep learning, machine learning type algorithms and have no purpose in gaming. So these are features of a card which will be functionally off when we're playing games. And that's part of the cost that would be removed from future gaming cards. And it also means that you could put other stuff there. It means that you could potentially uh, reduce the physical footprint of the GPU uh, or that even the HBM might change in the future to a different memory type. We don't know the exact details of gaming Volta cards, but it gives, this gives us a foundation from which we can build a base understanding and start to look into NVIDIA's next big architecture. So let's start with overclocking notes. We have an OC stepping table that we can put on the screen that shows the complete stock card starting out, operating at a peak frequency of 1682 megahertz in Firestrike Extreme's looping stress test, with an average of 1507 megahertz after thermal limitations are applied. Simply increasing the fan speed to 90% immediately pushes us to 1605 megahertz average with no other changes, and we next increase the power target and fan speed, dragging us up to 1672 megahertz average. From there, we incrementally stepped core offset upwards, eventually encountering stability issues at around 225 megahertz with one reboot in between due to driver crashes. Our final core offset was 200 megahertz, and the final HBM offset was also 200 megahertz. We left the fan at 100% speeds and were still bound by thermals, sitting at around 81 to 84 degrees Celsius. We'll be taking the more in-depth thermal measurements, including VRM measurements in our next few content pieces, along with power consumption. But today, we're looking at gaming alone. This card has a lot more room for overclocking in it, but we need to liquid cool it. We might do things like shunt mods in the near future with some help from Buildzoid to really see what we can get out of the card. Right now, it looks like we're running into thermal limitations first, so to be very clear on how Pascal and, it seems, Volta both work, the first thing we learned about Volta is boost functions pretty much the same way as on Pascal. There may be new things in there we don't know about yet, but as far as how it works with thermal and power limitations, what's happening is once you exceed the magical 60 degrees Celsius number, you do start dropping clocks a bit. Now, obviously, you tend to always operate above that number for the most part without going liquid or crazy on your fan speeds. So you're not really thermal throttling, so to speak. You're just not clocking as high as the thermal limitation would allow you to. Once you get to 80 degrees Celsius, it really starts dropping clocks. Uh, and at 84, you basically hit a wall. So that looks about the same on Volta. It might be a little bit lower on the V, the Titan V that we have here. And if it is lower, it's 81 or 82 degrees instead of 84. But we're basically up against the limit. So we'll try and do a hybrid mod. But subscribe so you can catch that when it comes up, if it does. We need to see if we can actually adapt a cooler to it without crushing or cracking the HBM first, because it's $3,000. So that'll come at the end of the process. But that looks like about where we're limited is 200 megahertz core and memory. It's actually a very good overclocker so far. We haven't really had problems with it. 
other than running into thermal and power limits. Two things that we are capable of somewhat resolving, if not mostly resolving. So that's something we'll be looking at shortly. Uh, there will be no partner models of this particular card, but presumably Volta will come to consumer. And if it does, we would hope to see similar overclocking behavior as we're seeing here. But the clock behaves basically the same as Pascal as far as it pertains to the various boost limitations and interactions with thermal uh, power and voltage restrictions. We have no voltage control right now to speak of. So short of doing shunt mods, that's about where we're stuck. Let's look at some of the other benchmarks though. So we can start with Time Spy and Synthetics. The point of this is to establish a baseline for how uh, this particular architecture behaves with very repeatable, reliable synthetic benchmarks that have specific elements in their benchmarks that we can pinpoint and say, the difference between these two numbers is tessellation or is ray tracing or stuff like that. So we'll start with Time Spy. As always, for the test methodology and the platform we used, you can check the article linked in the description below. Time Spy gave us more trouble than Firestrike, or any of the games for that matter, and refused to launch the second graphics benchmark at all without bringing memory back down to a 150 megahertz offset from 200 and core down to 175. Everything else was fine at 200 for each. Time Spy measured our graphics score at 12,308 points for the stock Titan V, placing it 22% ahead of the stock Titan XP, tested again today. That one was at 10,092 points. Overclocking the MSI 1080 Ti Gaming X got us the closest to the Titan V at 10,798 points, and this marks the stock Titan V as 14% ahead of the 1080 Ti Gaming X overclocked card. Comparing the frame rates from each of the two graphics tests will help us understand where Volta is doing better, Volta holds approximately a 23% lead in graphics test 1, which we can show, and about a 20-21% to lead in graphics test 2. Graphics test 2 has about 3 times as much tessellation as graphics test 1, and relies more heavily on volume ray casting, which dynamically traces rays through the volume for each pixel. Graphics test 2 tends to be significantly more memory sensitive, and will crash faster under borderline stable VRAM clocks. This gives us a starting point for where Pascal and Volta diverge, particularly when knowing the tessellation versus ray casting differences of the two benchmarks. Looking at Firestrike, let's start with Ultra and check the graphics scores for baseline. This one shows less of a lead than Time Spy, which uses newer, lower level programming techniques than Firestrike. With Firestrike Ultra, we're actually seeing our Titan XP overclocked card outperform the Titan V by about 5.3%. Overclocking the Titan V, of course, gets it ahead of the overclocked Titan XP, leapfrogging it by 8.3%. This isn't all that impressive, particularly considering how much better it did in Time Spy relatively, versus an overclocked 1080 Ti Gaming X, the overclocked Titan V is about 16% ahead. Again, for the price difference, not that impressive. To understand why this behavior occurs, we can look at Graphics 1 and Graphics 2 scores once again. Graphics Test 1 loads the GPU with polys and heavy tessellation. It does not, however, apply much of a compute load. Graphics Test 2 increases compute workloads and can stress the memory more, similar to Time Spy Graphics Test 2, but with less tessellation focus than in Time Spy. Looking at the numbers, we see somewhat considerable gains in the Titan V with Graphics Test 1, ranking at 48 FPS average stock, as opposed to the Titan XP's 40 FPS average stock. The Titan V manages a significant 20% lead here, but also falls behind in Graphics Test 2. The V is at 26 FPS versus 26 FPS for the stock Titan XP in Graphics Test 2, and overclocking each card gets them both to 29 FPS for Graphics Test 2. Despite a considerable 22% lead in GT1 for the Titan V, the 55 versus 45 FPS numbers, for example, it is tied or slightly behind in Graphics Test 2 in the worst case scenarios. And a quick shout out to the Crossfire Vega 64s there, showing that Time Spy, Firestrike, and 3D Mark in general still care a lot about multi GPU, even if a lot of the games out there ne don't necessarily show the same level of near doubling in performance. But looking at all this data, it appears that the Titan V has stronger potential in tessellation and geometry heavy scenes. Anything with a great amount of geometric complexity, and it might also be somewhat memory bound in GT2, but we're not 100% positive on that right now. The advantage in Time Spy suggests that there's improved asynchronous compute performance with the Titan V over the previous Pascal cards, and this is something that we can look into pretty easily 
by using lower level API games like Doom, Sniper Elite 4, and potentially Ashes of the Singularity, all of which use either DirectX 12 or Vulkan. And let's start that off with Doom. With Doom at 4K and with asynchronous compute enabled, the stock Titan V places at 132 FPS average. For average frame rate alone, we're about 41% ahead of the Titan XP stock GPU. Overclocking the Titan XP, actually let's give it some help and defer to the overclocked hybrid XP, gets it to 113 FPS average. This allows the Titan V stock card to hold a 17% lead, and we did actually retest Doom and saw pretty much the same numbers as we've seen for the last couple of rounds of tests for the Titan XP, so no improvement there to speak of over the last few months. The stock Titan XP is largely choking on its cooling, and for starters, it's also limited in power for a restricted performance overall. Either way, once we account for a Titan V overclock, we're at 157 FPS average versus 113 FPS average, or back to a 39.5% lead for the Titan XP. Scaling is pretty linear between stock and overclock tests, and the Titan V does lag behind in one key area. That's frame times. We think part of this has to do with drivers. In fact, if you look at our older Titan XP data from around May, you'll notice that its low frame time performance was actually a bit better, as was also the case for the older 1080 Ti data. Looking at modern data sets with the Titan V and the Titan XP that were both tested again today, we see that they're closer in lows than they are to their older test data, like the Titan XP from previously. The big takeaway here, as indicated by TimeSpy, is that the Volta card seems to have improved performance specifically in asynchronous compute titles, at least this one, Doom with Vulkan, and we can dig into that theory further with Sniper and then reinforce it with D3D11 titles. As for the frame time differences, that looks like it's more of a driver thing overall, or potentially a change in the Doom software between the original tests and the more recent ones. Sniper Elite 4 is our next title, run at 4K with high settings, DirectX 12, and asynchronous compute enabled. Stock, the Titan V operates at 115 FPS average, with lows at 97 and 91 for 1% and 0.1% lows respectively. This places at about 27% ahead in average FPS of the Titan XP stock GPU, posting massive leads over the predecessor. This is after retesting the Titan XP with the latest drivers as well, so what we're seeing is a legitimate performance uplift in the Titan V despite its clock deficit. Before digging into the rest of that chart some more, let's analyze some of the data we have now. What we've learned in the past with Sniper Elite is that it's particularly shader intensive on both AMD and NVIDIA. Sniper Elite is one of the few titles where, when overclocked equally, the Vega 56 and Vega 64 cards show a bit more of a difference than we see elsewhere. It's also one of the few titles where when you clock them similarly, ignoring the memory differences in latency, the GTX 1080 and 1070 Ti achieve pretty similar performance in basically every title, except for Sniper uh, and Doom to some extent, because of that difference in shader reliance. So Sniper actually likes those extra shaders from the 1080 over the 1070 Ti, ignoring the memory latency aspect of that conversation. And it also likes the extra shaders from the Vega 64 over the Vega 56. Now this would then follow to the Titan V, which we're seeing significant uplift on today. And that seems to be a shader difference, potentially. There's a whole lot of other differences there. We can't account for all of them yet, it's too early. But that gives us a baseline. So it makes sense, the game is built to asynchronously queue render jobs into different shaders. So having more shaders means that you can have more simultaneous render jobs in flight actively. So that would follow that more shaders would help with your frame rate in this particular instance. Now, Sniper's also pretty sensitive to clocks, but the difference between what it cares more about is kind of nebulous. It depends on the architecture, it depends on if it's AMD or Nvidia. There's a lot of variables there. But generally this game, unlike a lot of the others, is extremely sensitive to pretty much any change in a GPU, except perhaps GDDR5 memory speeds. Back to the Sniper Elite 4 chart for a moment, overclocking the Titan V to its 200 megahertz offset gets us 41% ahead of our overclocked Titan XP hybrid card. This is a tremendous gain and shows that the card becomes more constrained by its stock clocks in this particular title. And the takeaway is that the extra shaders help but they need to be fed with higher frequencies to really engage fully. For reference, we'll highlight a 1080 Ti card. They're not too far behind, all things considered, and obviously make far more sense as an affordable gaming purchase that still permits max settings. 
Ashes of the Singularity is our final non-DirectX 11 title. This one posed a problem for us. We didn't plan to ever test cards of this caliber, and so our standard 4K test with high graphics immediately demonstrated a CPU bottleneck. As you can see here, all the cards basically equalize around 97 to 99 FPS average, so we cannot draw any conclusions as we're now bumping against external limits and the GPUs aren't fully engaged. For this reason, we reran a few tests with 4K crazy settings and applied an 8x MSAA option to force load on the GPU. So with 8 tab MSAA, we get down to a point where the numbers are now comparable. We don't have as many numbers for this as it was unplanned, but you get the idea. The Titan V operates at around 82 FPS average when overclocked, a lead of 9.5% over its stock configuration. Against the Titan XP, the stock Titan V has a lead of about 10.2% from a 74.85 to 67.9 FPS average. The low 1% and 0.1% low values represent frame time consistency and are also close by. This number sounds a lot more down to earth than previously and demonstrates the extent to which game development impacts scoring of this class of card. We cannot extrapolate wide reaching results from the other titles across all titles in gaming, but Ashes is DirectX 12 and it does not leverage the Titan V to the same extent as one of the other DirectX 12 titles, Sniper Elite 4. Either that or it doesn't become choked on the Titan XP pipeline enough to demonstrate those deltas. Moving on to another chart of limited tests, we have Hellblade, which is our Unreal Engine representative. Hellblade has our Titan V stock card at 67 FPS average, while our overclocked variant operates at 74 FPS average for an improvement of 10.5% over stock. Versus the Titan XP, we're at 49 FPS average stock and 54 FPS overclocked, putting us at 37% improved when comparing only the Titan V and the Titan XP numbers. Our improvement is 37% stock to stock. These gains are larger than we'd anticipated considering that this is a DirectX 11 title and several key functions of the Titan V are unutilized in games. Let's look at Ghost Recon for another one. At 4K and very high settings, the Titan V GPU operates at 62 FPS average with lows at 54 and 50. This is a stark difference from the last few games. The 1080 Ti GPUs have no trouble keeping up with the Titan V stock GPU at all, and the overclocked 1080 Ti SE2 somewhat proves that point by achieving parity. The $750 card shows the importance of GPUs targeted purely at gaming, particularly when matched against its $3,000 scientific targeted counterpart. Against the Titan XP, we're still looking at a difference of about 1 to 2 FPS between the Titan V and XP, so nothing exciting there. Overclocking the Titan V gets us a bit beyond the XP overclock, about 6% ahead of the overclocked hybrid XP performance, and demonstrates what's lacking. Ghost Recon seems to want higher clocks, and the additional shaders just aren't helping. This is why it's important to have a wide sweep of games rather than just all games, and then talk about what drives those differences, or at least what we think drives those differences. There's a lot to know here, and we haven't figured it all out yet. Ghost Recon is more old school in its DirectX 11 implementation. If For Honor shows us similar results, we can start building a case about certain DirectX 11 titles and Titan performance, at least as it pertains to Ubisoft. 1440p and 1080p results will be in the article below. And here's For Honor, also made by Ubisoft. At 4K, the stock Titan V has us at 83 FPS average, but with lows ranging somewhat sporadically from 29 0.1% to 40 FPS 0.1%. The 1% lows range from 57 to 74. This range is significantly wider than we see on other cards and potentially indicates driver level frame pacing issues with the drivers. The Titan V still manages to chart top, but it's only a couple FPS ahead of overclocked 1080 Ti cards. Versus the stock Titan XP, the Titan V is about 14% ahead, so it's a lot closer than in some of the other titles though the lows are somewhat difficult to compare given their seeming randomness. Moving on to Destiny 2 for another DirectX 11 title and starting with 4K high settings, we get another scenario where the Titan V stock GPU only marginally outpaces the Titan XP GPU. The difference is about 4.1%, with the XP showing significantly stronger frame time consistency than the Titan V. We are not presently sure if this is a driver optimization layer problem or a fundamental behavior when deploying a scientific card in a gaming scenario. Here's a look at a frame time plot between the Titan XP and the Titan V, just to give an idea of what those frame times look like when realized over time, as they should be. The lower numbers here are better, but you also want more consistency, so it's not just strictly lower is better, it's more consistent and lower is better. Moving on, we look at the overclocking 
version of the Titan V, which got an FPS of 125 average in the same test, providing a substantial 21% lead over the stock Titan V, but the card still struggles with frame time consistency. Performance is comparable to the Titan XP and 1080 Ti when stock, minimally, and illustrates there are low-level API gains that stop with a title like Destiny 2. At 4K and highest settings, we only have a few cards present as the new Destiny 2 NVIDIA drivers wiped out our charts because we needed to retest everything. The Titan V tested at 88 FPS average, with the overclock granting an 18% uplift, still significant. It would appear that Destiny cares at least a little bit about clocks, whereas some of the other titles we looked at don't necessarily care as much and might like shaders more. The Titan V also carries a 13.6% lead over the Titan XP stock GPU when under the highest settings. And what this illustrates for us is that as we move towards certain types of titles, like Ghost Recon and For Honor, we start seeing performance that's a lot closer. The bigger gaps for the Titan V and the Titan XP at this point were around 14-15%, somewhere in that range. So being that that's the widest we see, obviously that's not extremely exciting for a $3,000 card. To be fair, it's not really meant for that type of task, but the idea is less of what it's meant for and more of what we're seeing in the other games, which is things that have async compute, things that use lower level APIs, and some of that could be just a uh, coincidence that the game developers focus more on optimization in general. We know, for example, that id Software put a tremendous amount of effort into building Doom to work extremely well with just about everything. So the fact that we're seeing big performance gains there, it's kind of hard to pull from that just how much does that apply to other Vulcan titles. And there aren't a lot of Vulcan titles to really test. There's Talos, but no one plays that, and it's pretty old at this point anyway. So we're left wondering at that point. Sniper Elite 4 shows an asynchronous compute DirectX 12 implementation that benefits the Titan V pretty heavily. But then again, we look at the Ubisoft titles and you encounter questions of, but how does it look with DirectX 11? Ashes of the Singularity, which is a long-standing DirectX 12 benchmark that's had plenty of time to be optimized on all drivers at this point, shows pretty close performance at sometimes 10 to 13% between the V and the XP, which again brings us back down to earth of, these aren't so exciting gains. But then again, you look at the gains that are huge, and they are kind of exciting, at least from a uh, numeric value difference standpoint. So that's what we have for the Titan V so far. Basically, if we're to try and learn from this data, given that it's not something probably any of you, or if any, then not many of you, will buy, uh, given that parameter, the takeaway really is just that it looks like it's worth keeping an eye on Volta specifically as it pertains to things like async compute implementations and low-level API performance. This is a key area where NVIDIA has not increased its gains as significantly as it's been able to with DirectX 11 optimizations, driver releases, and a long-standing code base of DirectX 11 support. So given that Titan V so far is looking pretty good in those low-level API implementations with the V, uh, which is admittedly a brute force solution, there might be a change there for Volta versus Pascal and Maxwell, which, although not necessarily bad in those implementations, were certainly not that impressive as compared to their relative DirectX 11 performance, where NVIDIA has spent a lot of time and money building their code base, drivers, and architecture to work well. So this might be a point where NVIDIA starts tipping the scales towards the lower level APIs. If that's true, and we're not saying it necessarily is, we need to see gaming cards, if that's true, it'll come down to developers, of course, actually doing more with these low-level APIs. But be careful how far you take that, because it's basically speculation based upon some testing of a scientific class card that has an insane amount of CUDA cores and is uh, not built for this particular task. So we can only take that so far, but take it for what it is. It's an academic experiment, basically, with a high-end card. You could game with it if you wanted to. It's just not meant for that. So uh, 1080 Ti is still the clear winner if you're trying to pick it for a high-end gaming device. But we'll see what Volta does when it comes to gaming. So that's all for now. Check back soon for our production test, which is more what the card's meant for. And we're going to be doing a lot with power, thermals, overclocking, modding as well. So you'll want to subscribe for all of that. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net slash modmat if you like the mat we have on the table here and would like to pick one up, it's on pre-order right now and is brand new. And if you would rather support us through Patreon, you go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus 
As always, the article is in the description below. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time. This mat's pretty cool.